each issue has to be dealt with on its own merits rather than on a broad spectrum of, yes, we should be there. No, exactly, we and I think it changes as it goes. You know, I was there in May. Um, in the summer, the two other, uh, the three aid workers were killed, two of them Canadian. And then just last week, there was another aid worker, I think, from England who was, who was shot. And I don't think I would have gone. Like, I, would, I don't think I would go now, given the, those things that had happened. And I'm not sure that Kara would have encouraged me to go. There, are, there have been other NGOs, as you mentioned, that have pulled out. Mm-hmm. Kara clearly has a commitment, mm-hmm. because it, we said they've been there since 1996. Mm-hmm. And that's Care Canada. Care Canada, yeah. Did you come across any other NGO workers? Do Tons, especially in Kabul, because most of their headquarters are there. There's, the Red Cross is really big there. The United Nations, of course. I think Oxfam is there. The Red Cross, or Red Crescent, there is the biggest. I mentioned it to you before. I, I think I told you I had spoken to uh, Robert Pelton. I don't right. know if you're familiar with his work. He's always seems to be on the ground and, yep. uh, and sees things firsthand and, and gets out just barely <laughs> yeah. every time. He, one of his uh, observations in, after having visited probably 20 war zones was nothing was more volatile mm-hmm. than an emerging democracy. Mm-hmm. So based on that observation, would you think it would have been a mistake for Stephen Harper to say, yes, we're going to pull out by 2011, and that would give insurgent forces kind of a timeline on which to know that they can go back in and destabilize or undo any of the work that has been done? Wow. You know what? As much as I am happy to wade in with my personal opinions, I probab- I'm i really not qualified to... I'm not, I don't feel qualified to talk to that. And it, it's true because it does get, you know, there's such an intersection of opinion and and fact and that yeah. unfortunately that's you know exactly the reality of a situation like like that and and you brought up another great point there are the overlapping interests and of the military presence so what the purpose of that presence is but then there's also the intersection of again the resource wars mm-hmm. the yeah. oil pipeline well unical isn't in business anymore but oil mm-hmm. companies and and of course did you get to talk to anybody about the opium trade and what their opinion was on I t- actually, I talked to the, the guy who was our security person, had been with the Canadian Forces in the South, and he, he, we talked a lot, and he said that the opium trade w- was now so huge, he didn't know what they were going to do about it now. The, the thing with it now is that the money from it is going, it's funneled into these, surg- in these insurgent groups. So regardless of how you feel about drugs and should they be shipping them around, the, the key thing, it seems, is that the income, first of all, that the income from them goes to equip and arm, you know, violent groups. And also that the, the warlords who are in control of the opium are the ones who are most interested in keeping the whole area unstable. So, you know, you have um, the the groups like the Taliban that are religious zealots, and then you have the opium warlords who are, they're just basically anarchistic, I, I think, I don't know. Um, but their their interest is not religion. Their their interest is just protect, is using whatever they can to uh, protect their trade. And it, then it, like, where it gets, I think, really complicated for people in the West, and as I understand it, please check this with somebody who knows what they're talking about, but as I understand it, one of the difficulties for Westerners there regarding the opium crops is that a lot of a lot of the opium or some of the opium is grown by small local farmers who have no other way of making a living. So they've got these small, you know, rocky patches and they're not gonna grow wheat for export, but they can grow opium to feed their family. Do we want to go in and destroy that farmer's livelihood? That that just drives them into the arms of the insurgent groups who will say, we will protect you and we will protect your income against these foreigners. And y- you are exactly right. There are small farmers who do rely on those, exactly. those little patches. Exactly. I veered us right into like an area of <laughs> talking about foreign policy and, and the, the bigger picture, but I didn't want to g- get back to 
talking about the experience that you had oh, right. um, with you know women and one, one of the, the things that you provided especially some there was in the photo essay mm -hmm. the vocational training uh, for Afghan women project the mm -hmm. VTA WP mm -hmm. uh, were there other similar programs uh, uh, that you could tell us about?